Mental Health Lecture Series. Um, and my name is Teresa Quartz. I'm a pediatric intensivist at UCSF. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Paul. And um, I'm afraid I actually don't know Benjamin. So Paul, I'll let you introduce Benjamin. But in a brief introduction for Paul, he's um, MedPeds trained. He's um, faculty here at UCSF, um, has uh, worked extensively in global health, including having done, um, uh, a, sorry, I'm just blanking on the, um, Paul, you did a Peace Corps, sorry, in which country? In Madagascar. Yeah. In Madagascar, sorry. So it has done Peace Corps work as well as continues to do research abroad and is currently in Uganda um, doing malaria uh, research, which he will tell us about. And if Paul, if you would like to say anything else about yourself and if you wouldn't mind introducing Ben, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. I do most of my work on malaria and mostly in Uganda these days. Um, and then my good friend Benjamin Kudu is a, a PhD um, um, gentleman from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, we've been working together. Well, we've been aware of each other's work because we are both uh, sort of par in parallel working on um, bed net monitoring and tools for bed net monitoring. And um, we, uh, in the last few years, have kind of uh, uh, worked more closely together and actually are starting to win some grants together. Um, to kind of push this work forward. Um, so I'm excited to have him join us today and he can talk about some of his expertise. Um, and maybe Benjamin, uh, if there's anything else you wanted to say in introduction, and then if not, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, yes, uh, as you said, Paul, yes, I think we discussed briefly a few years ago, so we discussed about the possibility and opportunity to work together on uh, monitoring of the net usage between malaria and the milk community. And uh, I'm happy that we have now some concrete opportunity to start from field work and uh, data collection and data analysis and processing and hope that that will end up with some real change of policy uh, about how to effectively quantify business usage within pandemic community. So I'm happy to be with you for this talk and present much better the device we uh, use, we test in the field. Thank you. Thanks, Benjamin. So um, wonderful, thank you again, Teresa. So um, <clears throat> our talk today is about the use of, um, it's gonna be a little bit more broad than just the bed monitoring um, technology that, that we use. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about bed nets in general uh, for the prevention of malaria. And then we'll get into some of the specifics of um, some newer technologies that Benjamin and I are using publishing on um, that are getting some interest in the field for ways to improve how we how we measure bed net use um, to try to help improve uh, malaria prevention um, worldwide and in particular among children. Um, just as a quick disclosure, uh, I, I have a small nonprofit organization that I've been working with for many years as a director and a founder. Um, and I'm just required to disclose that because I think they have funded some of the work um, that you'll hear about today. Um, and in addition, um, uh, one of the uh, older technologies that we use for bed net monitoring is called SmartNet. Um, we'll also talk about that a little bit today as well. Um, and um, I have a small you know, stake in intellectual property for that, but it's not for sale right now. So it's not very remunerative, um, but it's somehow required as they say as well. Um, so just as a, a quick outline for our talk today, uh, I thought first we could go through um, a quick discussion of malaria, the state of malaria currently, um, and how bed nets fit into malaria prevention, both kind of classically and then how, how bed nets are being um, used currently. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of a conceptual framework about how at least this is how I think about how um, bed net distribution and use. Um, we're going to talk about some studies that I've worked on in Madagascar looking at bed net ownership. We'll talk about some of the challenges of measuring bed net use itself. 
and some tools um, for bed net monitoring. And then we'll talk at the end about um, some newer tools Excel, using Excel accelerometers and some machine learning um, to try to uh, monitor the use of bed nets. And then we'll talk about some next steps that we're hoping to, hoping to, to do in terms of future studies. And with that, um, maybe I'll turn it over to Benjamin and he can um, give us a couple of slides of introduction. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. I think uh, in 2020, this, this will be last data from uh, malaria annual report. There were about 241 million cases and 620,000 death worldwide and most of them as you know is between children and the five and we have two crucial facts i think that is what paul described here uh, much better I, I think the the most uh, most of the cases the deaf people are coming from uh, people under five years old i think that all paul yeah, and also the, the, that since 2015, we've had a real plateau in, in improvement in uh, yeah. malaria control, in particular in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where um, in, in many ways, malaria control has been essentially stalled. Um, great. Um, let's see. There we go. Yeah, so long lasting, currently, I think, uh, for malaria control, uh, the, the tool mostly used is long lasting sex net. It, 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 it's shown to have been really efficient in reducing malaria transmission. And I think most of the donor now, I, I know that TMI present malaria initiative is using also, also end of resource spray, but in many countries, this have been stopped like in Benin and so on because logistically it's just really challenging. And so most of the, in most of the malaria and the big country now, the main tool used is longer since extra treatment. And it, it has shown to reduce the child mortality by 23% and by reducing the malaria incident by 68% from 2000 to 2015. Next slide, please. So, uh, and yes, so far we have more than 200 million been that distributed in 2020, but WDO call uh, for two, around 3 billion people who have to have access to long lasting sex treatment. Yeah, and so it's a it's a very widespread um, technology um, and widespread tool for for public health in general. It's one of the most widespread, and many most countries nowadays have a what's known as a universal distribution um, policy, where they give the bed nets out for free. Um, and the WHO stance is that all individuals at risk of malaria, so that's up to three billion people across the world. Um, should be have access to be, be using their bed nets um, per night. So it's a they're very common in in countries that have malaria, which is well, quite a, a quite a chunk of the world. So two mechanisms of action regarding our uh, bed network is provide individual protection via barrier repellent insecticide effect. And it provides also community wide vector control via insecticides that kill the mosquitoes. That is, these are the two modes of action when you sleep and uh, uh, you protect yourself. And also, even if within the community, the coverage, if within the community, the coverage is above 65 or 70 percent, you have a, a community protective effect which helps even to protect those who are not using the net as well. Yeah, so kind of the way the way I think about bed nets is um, sort of a two-sided um, a two-sided uh, picture. 
or you have the demand side, which is how, you know, how do we get households to have access to and retain and want to own bed nets? And then you have a second, second factor, which is uh, number two here. It, it's great if households own bed nets, but if they're not using them and using them consistently, if they're not educated about the correct ways of using the bed nets, then um, we won't be able to stop malaria. So these, these two factors for a public health system, um, they implicate different um, expertise and different uh, roles. So you have one that's talking about the delivery of bed nets and, and um, education about the value of bed nets. And then there's another question about changing or trying to support positive behaviors around people getting used to using bed nets and, and seeing the value of them. And I think this is kind of the framework for some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, we'll talk about some, some studies related to mostly around ownership, and then we'll move on to the to the current tools that we're using, which are really focused on um, the, the factors related to use of bed nets. So um, some of the research questions that I've run into and that Benjamin has worked on a lot um, are when we think about the, the factors that affect the ownership or use of bed nets, um, when we can think about some of the barriers and use that as a way to, to try to study and understand how bed nets are used. So on the left column here, we have some potential barriers, perhaps perhaps knowledge and, and a lack of knowledge about malaria is a, is a potential barrier. And then we can work on some of the solutions. We can do targeted education campaigns. We can do more general education. Um, we can do radio shows. We can do um, education just in the regular health system. Um, and maybe that will help improve bed net ownership and get more bed nets into houses. Um, maybe it's an issue of availability. So here you're talking about very logist, uh, very um, practical logistic issues. Like we need to get um, more bed nets to the right locations and the right distribution centers so that they can be delivered to to uh, households. Or we need to couple um, bed net distribution with vaccine programs so that every time a child comes to get their measles vaccine, they also get a, a bed net. Um, a new bed net. And so that, that way we will be sure we're hitting our target demographic in terms of distribution. Um, so that's, those are other potential type solutions for the barriers around availability. Um, it's also this idea of agency. So if, if people aren't aware that malaria is even something that they can try and prevent or that they should prevent, um, You'd be surprised in many places in Africa, malaria is um, a, such a common um, issue that uh, people, people sometimes don't have the sense that they can prevent it. Um, and so we do things like um, try to do mothers and women's empowerment or just around education. We can explain to people that even if you're still getting on average one case of malaria per year, which is quite common for many in many malaria endemic settings, even with good prevention. Um, that's better than getting three or four cases a year, which might be common if you weren't using things like bed nets. Um, so we can work on trying to improve people's understanding and education. And then an important, um, an important topic that we're going to talk a little bit about, um, but that is now, now it is pretty, pretty well settled, is, is the cost of the bed nets um, and whether bed nets should be given out for a, a cost or whether they should be given out for free um, generally. So that goes into a study that I worked on in Madagascar. Um, this was in 2004 when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, my wife and I, my wife's a health economist, um, we designed a study that was looking at um, trying to assess the demand for bed nets at different prices. So we actually designed a randomized control trial in, in Madagascar among 12 different villages. Um, and we it's about total 350 households. And we gave a randomized, so in a randomized fashion, um, as you can see here on the right, we gave out prices, we gave out bed nets at different prices. Um, and then the goal was to look at, um, based on the, the price that these households were able to obtain the nets, um, we were able, we were wanting to look at both how likely they were to own a bed net 
um, owned the bed net that we were giving out and also how likely they were to use the bed net. Um, and again, this is important. This is a time in this area in Madagascar where there was uh, pretty limited access to bed nets. So they, they were not widely available as they are today. Um, and so people were, there was a lot of demand for the bed nets because people wanted to protect themselves and their families from malaria. I think I forgot to say too, if there are questions, I'm happy to, or if, or if uh, you need some clarifications, please speak up or maybe put something in the chat and someone can, can just remind us. Um, so this is a, a picture. So these, these little pieces of paper that people are holding, we went to each household in these villages. We gave them one voucher for, for a, a bed net at the, at the cost that their village had been um, assigned to. Um, these are just some of the participants with their vouchers. Um, so at baseline, only about 4% of households own bed nets, which is quite low. Again, this was back in 2004. And only 1% of households reported actually using their bed nets regularly. Um, but after um, the, the using this distribution scheme, um, you can see here that um, the, the price of the net is on the left leftmost column. And just to the right of that is the percentage of households that ended up owning their net after, I think it was after a month, when we went back and visited the household. And households that received a voucher for a free bed net, all 100% 100 of those households redeemed their, their coupon for a free net. Um, and then you can see a nice curve here as the prices went up from 1,000, which is about 60,000 RERI, which is about 60 cents to you know, $1.20 to 240. As the price went up, you can see a steady decline in the, the household ownership. Um, and then we were also interested in looking at like what the effect of, of that was on it and usage. And I think I have a, a plot here. These are just some other people again lining up kind of around the block to get their to get their bed net. So definitely bed nets were in demand at this point. Um, and so this is a, a more graphical way of looking at that data from the table. Um, but essentially you're looking at the, the dark blue line, which is ownership of bed nets, and you can see a very, a very clear um, uh, I think in economics, but kind of elasticity of demand, as price goes up, you see the, the eventual the, um, coverage among households to, to decline. What was interesting was this pink line, the ownership, the use uh, line. So even though these households um, that got their bed nets for, for free, 100% um, of them were um, actually like ended up picking up the nets. Um, you still see that only about 50 to 50 to 55 percent of them were reporting that they were using them. And so this gets to a pretty well-defined um, issue, at least uh, around the distribution of free goods, um, where the um, education about what what these um, technologies are for and education about um, bed nets in particular is very important to ensure that there's um, high levels of use because of uh, a well-known effect that sometimes when people get things for free, they don't value them at quite the same. Um, they wonder why they're just being given out for free. Um, and this is a pretty, a pretty well um, described um, phenomenon these days and a much, much larger trials, um, is, you know, contemporaneous with this study basically showed that a similar finding is that as price goes up, the ownership of bed nets declines. And there's actually, there's an optimal price that is somewhat more than um, free, more than zero, that where people actually uh, take pride in ownership of their nets and actually end up uh, paradoxically using them more overall as a as a as a um, as a community. Um, so that was a, that was an interesting finding from this study is that um, perhaps a small little fee, at least in this area in Madagascar, might have been more effective in uh, getting people to use their bed nets regularly. So um, as an adjunct to this study, um, we we had given the price given the bed nets out for different prices. Um, so then we thought, well, what if we could use small incentives to um, help increase the community ownership and use of bed nets? Um, this idea of behavioral incentives has been used in um, a variety of different health settings. Um, in developed countries, uh, it's very common around you know, weight loss or uh, exercise. 
behaviors, tobacco cessation. Um, at this point, when this study, this next study was done, um, there were in developing countries, there was um, the behavioral incentives, the programs looking at child immunizations and tuberculosis care. Um, but no one had yet at this point looked at the use of small behavioral incentives to encourage the use of, of bed nets. And the idea with the behavioral incentive is a small prize or a small, uh, a small payment that would um, increase, uh, boost the, the demand for and use of bed nets. And the idea that we looked at in, in this next randomized trial was, could we use these small bonuses to, um, to increase uh, community coverage in Madagascar? So this is a few years later after that prior study um, in 2007. Um, now we had about 21 villages, uh, about almost 520 households that we randomized. Um, we had two, two groups, uh, an intervention group and a control group. Um, the control group, um, both groups, excuse me, received a coupon for one free bed net. Um, as we saw in the previous study, like we expected all of those bed nets to be redeemed, all those vouchers to be redeemed for free bed nets. Um, but the intervention households were additionally told, um, so about to half the households, they, they were additionally told that if they were using their bed net um, after a month, then they would receive an unspecified bonus or prize um, when we came back to their house for an unannounced visit. And the idea was to see um, how, what the effect of that bonus or prize would have on eventual use of bed nets. Um, so here in the um, main, main findings here, we looked in particular, uh, unsurprisingly from the prior study, 100% of the, essentially 100% of the bed nets were redeemed. So giving out bed nets for free in this area would, um, there was plenty of demand for the bed nets to own a bed net. Um, but there were some interesting findings around bed net use. So here we're looking at um, the, the, the plot, the solid line is the intervention group. Um, so starting at around five or six percent at baseline um, use. Um, so that's reported bed net use. Uh, after one month, um, there was nearly 99% you know, use among the group that was told they would receive their small prize. And then um, in the control group, um, bed net use was only around 78%, and that was statistically significant. Um, interestingly, after six months, as you see, um, uh, as you follow the plot to the right, you see that the bed net use among the intervention group declined from 99% to about 93%, whereas the um, bed net use was starting to increase among the group that only got the free nets uh, almost to 90%. Um, and so that was an interesting finding is that it's, it appears that the effect of the incentive um, seemed to wane over time. So, you know, people are motivated by the prize perhaps initially, and then over time, they uh, perhaps revert still to a very high level of use and still um, maybe, you know, at least as high as the control group, but their, their motivation to use the bed nets declines a little bit as the, uh, as the saliency of the intervent of the uh, uh, incentive starts to decline, and again, that's a very another common finding in the in the health economics literature around behavioral incentives is that um, the effects seem to wane over time. Um, something I'd like to point out, however, is that that this differential use here um, still gets me excited about. Uh, and someday thinking about using uh, behavioral incentives to boost bed net use. Um, this shaded area is, is represents use that would not have been um, achieved without the incentives. And so perhaps there's some value in uh, small incentives to, in particular among uh, high-risk groups, pregnant women, or in, in an epidemic setting. Um, perhaps we could use these incentives to increase use and uh, um, kind of boost use above um, what might be a, a regular level. Um, and because all those shaded areas represent, you know, additional malaria prevention. So maybe I'll turn it over to Benjamin now. We're sort of transitioning from talking about um, bed net ownership to talk about why we're interested in bed net use itself and some of the factors related to monitoring bed net use.
Benjamin, I think you're on mute if you wanted to try to present here, or otherwise I can I can continue. Maybe maybe I'll continue. Um, oh, there you go, Benjamin. Did you want to take over for a couple of slides? Yeah. So as I said before, it, a lot of money and resources have been invested in the net uh, uh, distribution and so on. But we do have some a lot of question because the challenge is not people to get it only, but how people are been at have been used and how to effectively measure if it has been used or not. Because the main uh, question people are asking so far is, are you sleeping? Did, did you sleep until the night, the night before? And is it sometimes the, the person you are asking give you the answer, he thinks that which will please you. So sometimes they say yes. So, so far we don't have any non-invasive tool or method which could be used to really, really measure effective use of the net. So the traditional measure, as I said, is with self-reporting, service self-reporting, the use of night, or of the, the use of the net the night before. But this, as I said, it, it, it violates the privacy of the community and I think Many people do not like it, not that they don't like it. you are asking them the question, is because sometimes we need to do direct observation to confirm that the bed has been tied and if someone is effectively sleeping under the net. So that is what we call non uh, in a non night visit to confirm usage, and these have some bias and he violated the privacy of the people and scientific, Malala scientific community uh, are giving a lot of criticism about it. So uh, as uh, a malaria logist, uh, as a malaria specialist, we are thinking about really a tool, we are looking for a tool which could be used to monitor effectively, who could give us some quantity data which could be, could, could, could confirm net usage. So one time measure don't capture important seasonal variation because that is something as Paul said before I publish. Uh, because if you are in a community where Binet is not used uh, uh, very frequently by, by people and is seasonal use, that is how that, that is why it will be important to use tools like the motion sensor because on time, it time, it let you know when the data has been used or not. And like malaria transmission intensity, many of these variations are locally determined. Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, and so um, just to speak a little bit to, to the challenges around measuring bed net use, um, this is a study that, that, that I published uh, some years ago now in 2018. Um, where I was trying to get at, I was trying to measure what the rate of bias was. Like we, Benjamin had mentioned, occasionally we, we get concerned with our self-reports where we go from household to household and ask people about their bed net use the prior night. And we get concerned that, that there may be some level of overestimation where people overinflate slightly um, as a, we call it like a, a social desirability bias. Uh, they give you the answer that, that you want to hear. Um, especially since you're part of the group that just gave them this nice new free net. Um, and so in this study, I was actually doing a meta-analysis looking at, um, I think I had 18 different studies or 19 studies um, where in this, within the same study, within the same community and study setting, um, we were looking at, um, uh, there, there were measures of both uh, the self-reported measure where people tell you about their bed net use and at the same time, there was some other uh, objective quantification. So um, one of these, looking back here, one of these uh, bottom, bottom ways of measuring bed net use, whether you look at whether the bed net is hanging um, in the household, you do unannounced night visits, or you do actual observations of people's bed net use over time at night. 
And so um, in each of these studies here, uh, you, you can see in each of these studies, I had two measures. And what, I'm look, what we're looking at is a difference between the measures here. Um, and you can see the, the relative difference. Um, most of the studies tends towards the right side, which means that uh, the, the self-reported um, difference, the self-report uh, proportion is higher than what you see by a, a kind of a more objective method on it, unsurprisingly. And in the end, we, we see about a 13% um, overestimation of bed net use in this meta-analysis. And as Benjamin will talk about, and I can attest from some of my studies, that that's a, like spot on to what we find when we use our accelerometers or use our other more objective tools, about a 13% overestimation of bed net use is, uh, is pretty common. Um, and so that that describes um, what, we dis what we would call like a social desirability bias and a, and a lack of precision and a lack of accuracy um, in the most common tools that are used for um, surveillance of bed net use. Um, and again, that's another motivation for the use of these other monitoring tools. Um, I think I'll go back to Benjamin for a couple of slides. Okay, thank you very much. So, as we said, is the, the goal for using the motion sensor is to measure when the net is unfolding for use or folding up. Also, measure timing of interaction in, in net users because in many malaria and the community, and people are not using the net very often. So we need to know uh, when exactly the net are used and when net are not used. Because any bite received by people sleeping under the net could, could end up uh, which for being a malaria cases. So for us, it's very important to understand why when we distribute a net in a special community, knowing that the ownership is very high, but why the incidence of malaria, of mortality rate is still high. So we don't, it's important to don't miss any part of net use or not use, but to know every time what the net is used and not used, yes. So the, the duration of binet use per night, as I said, because we know that mosquito bite start sometime between six, seven, from six, seven p.m. to five, six, six, six a.m. the next day. So time when binet are used are very important because we need to check to confirm that Business usage, timing of business uses match with the timing of mosquito biting activity. So, as I, I said, time of use, time a binet is in fall at night, time binet is falling up in the morning, and seasonal time in use pattern. These are very important to know because if you are sleeping under the net late night, that means that you have been exposed to some mosquito bite. And it's not, you will not be surprised that this type of people could see that he, he, he still, he, he's still getting malaria while he, he's sleeping under the net. Uh, but you, 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 you agree with me that he, he, he has some interruption. What is he's, he's, he's sleeping under the net, he's sleeping late night, he's not starting sleeping maybe you know, 9, 10, he could sleep at midnight like people are doing in, in a lot of malaria in the community. So interruption in use, number of interruption per net, timing and duration of interruption, those are very important parameters which could help us to better understand why in this community, people say that they are using the net, but why the number of malaria cases remain very, very high.
Thank you, Benjamin. Yeah, so first I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, one of the older technologies that we developed um, to, to measure bed net use um, to exactly get at those, those kind of newer metrics and new, newer ways of thinking about bed net use. Um, first, the, the, I developed a tool called the SmartNet. Um, and the idea with the SmartNet is that we use a conductive fabric that was, is woven into the sides of the net. So these um, lines and colors you see here are, are special fabric um, that when the bed net is folded up um, or uh, tied up, um, when people are not using their bed nets, we can actually detect that by using the, this um, small electronic device. And then we can log that data on the device um, over time. And that way we can get a sense of when people are putting their bed nets down, what time and how frequently. And then we can uh, associate that bed net use with malaria outcomes or, or get better sense of people's behaviors. Um, and so the original device worked for about eight weeks at a time in the field. Uh, it was, you know, relatively relatively expensive, around 120 to 100 to 150 dollars uh, to make one of these. I think the main uh, drawback, which is something that we've improved on the most recent technology and the technology that Benjamin's been working on for a long time, is that uh, this device is very it's very obvious you're being monitored because these these things that are sewn into the sides of the net and this little box that's up in the corner of your net are things that are added on um, and, and might change your behaviors. And our more current devices um, are much less obtrusive. And that's one of the, one of the benefits. Um, these are just a few more pictures of, of these uh, nets that I, we, we actually had um, a seamstress in, in Uganda where we did this study in Western Uganda and Barara um, actually help us uh, make the nets. Um, and then another important um, uh, factor to talk about um, when we're using these monitoring tools is acceptability. So um, getting a sense of what people in the community think about the fact that we're measuring their bed net use. We have sort of a tracking device above their bed while they're sleeping um, and, and what they think about the, that. Um, so to start addressing that back in 2016, before I started putting these in the field, um, we did a study with 50, 50 women in, in Western Uganda um, we showed them the bed net, um, the smart net, we explained to them what it's used for, and we were uh, eliciting some feedback about um, what they thought about the, about the net. Um, in general, the, the feedback was very positive and people were interested in it. There were some opinions about you know, the, the, the idea of being monitored, that that might be unacceptable to other people in their communities or to their uh, spouses, for example. Um, and um, there, we tried to address some of those some of those challenges. Uh, but the, the, in general, this is a group that wasn't going to use the net, so it, it wasn't surprising that they were pretty positive about it. Um, uh, later, in a, a similar population, different different groups now, but in the same area in Southwest Uganda, we actually did a a study in ten households where we used the devices. Um, but we went back and also did some acceptability, um, uh, you know, qualitative work, asking people about their experiences with the bed nets. We recently got this published um, a couple of months ago, um, where we actually asked people about their experience. And I would say, in general, very similar as the prior study, where people were quite positive about it. There was some, there were some uh, expressions of concern about having their behaviors monitored. Um, it points out the real importance of doing community education about exactly what sort of things are being monitored and tracked, um, showing people the data so that they understand, you know, what the researchers are, are actually tracking. Um, and in, in the end, in these communities, if you explain to people what, what you're doing, we have some very positive feedback. And in general, um, the qualitative study uh, confirmed that, that these devices are quite acceptable to at least to this community. Um, and I think it also gave us some, some ways of improving the technology and making it a little more humane. Like originally we had on the, these electronic devices, there was like a blinking light that would go off. And uh, as you can imagine, having a blinking light going off over your head at night, maybe that was a little bit uh, um, interruption. It caused some interruptions in your sleep. So these, these sort of uh, qualitative studies help us 
get data we might not even think about. And so that allowed us to, to then improve that and cover, cover up the device to make it a little less uh, intrusive. But in general, I think the, the take home is that these devices are pretty acceptable to, to the whole community with um, adequate education. Um, and this was from that original study, some, some data, again, um, on the left side of these plots. These are 10 different households, as I mentioned, um, uh, number one through 10. The left side is clock time from 1800, which is 6 p.m. at night till 9 a.m. Um, in the morning. Um, and then uh, along the x-axis are the number of days. And so for each of these households, you're seeing an actual plot of the of, of the daily um, daily hours of use. Um, and so these dark lines represent the times when that net is down. Um, and you can see a decent amount of variation in addition to, among these households, even, even in these households that know very well that we're monitoring their use. Um, you see a lot of different variation in patterns, um, which seem to be uh, you know, a common, common theme is that different households and different individuals use bed nets differently. Um, but then we can use this data to try to understand how people use their bed nets and also um, associate their bed net use with their actual malaria outcomes. This is another plot from that study, um, again, just showing uh, like the proportion of bed nets that are in use per hour over, over the night. Um, and you can see a, a decent amount of variation between these households. And I like this one. This is a, a plot of the interruptions in use. Um, and so the, all of the households are, are prepared here is what the 10 households on the, the y-axis and the clock time of the interruptions. And we define an interruption as um, once the bed net is unfurled or you know, unfolded around a bed, um, each of these little bubbles represents a time when that bed net was folded back up. And you can see that the size of the, the, size of the uh, bubble represents how long it was unfolded, or sorry, how long it was folded up. So it's one way of measuring uh, how how uh, the duration of an interruption, and so you know any any kind of duration that you know as as Benjamin was mentioning any kind of duration of not being covered by a bed net puts people at risk of malaria. Um, so this gave us some some information about you know it looks in particular early in the night um, we could try to try to work on education about um, interruptions in bed net use. Um, and try to get a better sense of when people are being exposed to, to mosquitoes. Maybe I'll transition here and we'll, we'll start talking about more newer technologies that Benjamin and I are using. Um, and, and I'll just mention some of the key challenges that um, the barriers that I've already alluded to with the SmartNet tool. Um, one is how obvious it is that you're being measured. Um, and so the concern is that perhaps uh, that might change how you act with your with your bed net, um, and so that would obviously uh, defeat the purpose of this monitoring. Where the goal is to actually get a sense of people's real use. Um, in addition, there's a lot of complexity in manufacturing the device. Uh, the battery life had some challenges, and it was not very um, easy to use in terms of washing. You know, it was very relatively fragile. I didn't really want people. Doing heavy, uh, heavy washing of the bed net that had the, the fabric interwoven into it. So those were some of the challenges with the smart net, and kind of got me working with Benjamin because I thought his technology was much, much more efficient. Um, and so I'll have Benjamin talk for a couple of slides about about the accelerometers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, before this uh, generation, we have a type of accelerometer uh, which uh, was set up by a company uh, but it was bigger than uh, I think that really and uh, I tested it in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire really in the field and I think it worked very well. It was less obtrusive, water resistant, out of the box solution and the battery is lasting very long. Uh, now, this, in this picture, this is really the new generation which pollen, uh, on which pollen high I, I published this year in February. 
Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, as I said, this was the first the generation before this one that I piloted in a study in Cote d'Ivoire in 2014, and in which uh, uh, the, the study demonstrated that the self reporting was really overestimated when you pass one or two weeks because when people are not sleeping very often under the net, they could not tell you exactly when uh, they use the, the, the bennet. So that's why we say that we need uh, an appropriate tool which could uh, monitor, could tell you exactly when and what time, what hour, what day the bennet have been using. But when you ask question, people used to tell you what you want to hear. It could tell you every day that every night that you use the bennet, which is not really the case because we know that in Africa or in Asia, in many Malaria and the big country, people that we can could go to funeral and so on. So, but we will tell you every time that they are they have been sleeping in the net. So this study also demonstrates that also use the bed more than when there were more mosquitoes. That is what demonstrates as well. When mosquito density is very high, a bed usage is very high. But when it's low. They are not you, you, you really using the net, and but they will tell you that they, they sleep in the net, some of them, which is not right. And this has been published in 2014 in Vector. And this, uh, as, as I said, the new generation of accelerometer was tested in Liverpool when I was there with participant mimicking Bennett use behavior. Mm -hmm. And Paul was, uh, yes, uh, we were, uh, he worked on ma machine learning algorithm, which uh, confirmed that 96% of the data uh, are, were really accurate in detecting Bennett unfurling and folding up. The model which also included entering a sitting Bennett was accurate at 83%. So this was published, uh, this study was funded by USAID and it was published this year in February. Yeah, so so this newer this newer technology that Benjamin is describing of using accelerometers, um, you know, these accelerometers are, are devices that are very similar to a Fitbit that you might wear. Um, you can buy these devices that will log over long periods of time, uh, lasting up to a couple of months in the field. Um, and just by attaching what you know is essentially the size of a watch face to a bed net, we can then then um, analyze using machine learning tools um, the the data that represents the shaking, um, you know, the X, Y, and Z movements of of that accelerometer, and then we can. Uh, classify off that the the bed net use at high accuracy, um, and so the the tools that so so now both Benjamin and I are working together and and, and working towards using these devices using these accelerometer devices. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about you know, what what can we do with this bed net monitoring besides just describing bed net use patterns, which is something of big interest, uh, very big interest to public health programs, malaria control programs. They want to know we're, we're we're spending you know you know millions of dollars investing in free distribution of our bed nets. How are people? How do people use them in the in the field? Uh, how do people use them in rural areas? Um, so that's one thing that we can do is we can describe patterns of use, look at differences among age groups, uh, look at the effect of mosquito density and temperature on, on the likelihood of people using their bed nets. Um, and uh, there's some interesting findings around um, age, uh, you know, adults and adults and children tend to use their bed nets better, uh, very young children. Um, and then you have these school age groups, which are, you know, kids typically described as like five to 15 who are notoriously thought to be poor users of the bed nets. And so there's a lot of questions out there about why that is and what we can do to improve bed net use among those age groups. Um, in addition here, this plot is, is looking at um, trying to assess mosquito exposure 
So when we're using these bed net monitors, we get a sense of how often, uh, of what time and the total duration of bed net use. Um, and this is from a study that I recently published, um, again, using the older technology, but it's a similar idea that we'll be able to do much better with the new technology. Um, each of these uh, bars here represents different ways of measuring bed net use. So you have the reported use um, in this study which is in uh, Eastern Uganda. We had a cohort of individuals. We asked them about their bed net use and almost 100% of people said they use their bed net. But then when we um, included information about the times that people typically go to bed. Um, so in this study, adults went to bed around 9 p.m. Um, we were able to uh, measure uh, the, to assess that about 30% of um, the mosquito exposure, potential mosquito exposure during the night, um, the people are acquiring before they go to bed. Um, and so, you know, it's probably not uncommon for, for people to go to bed around 9 p.m., just like it is in the United States. Um, but you have to think uh, about whether bed nets can actually uh, prevent malaria if 30% if of the exposure is occurring before people are actually under their bed net. Um, so that's an, an interesting, important finding that can help with malaria control programs and thinking about other ways of preventing malaria. Um, and then these two other bars are just two other ways of thinking about uh, measuring bed net use um, using that smart net tool. Um, and the, the take home from this is that the far, the far right most bar here, this blue bar represents a combination of using the smart net device, like looking at hourly bed net use with an objective monitor, and also uh, associ um, integrating uh, reported bedtimes. And you can see that when you do that, you can actually find that people are, are only covering about 53% of the total, total mosquito exposure in a night. Um, and so this, at least in this area in Uganda, where there's very a high density of early night biting from mosquitoes, um, you wouldn't be surprised if bed nets are not as effective as they might might have been in the past or um, might not be 100% effective because people are getting almost 50% of potential exposure even before they can use their bed nets. Um, and so those, these are some important findings that the malaria control programs find uh, that can inform their decisions about malaria prevention going forward. Um, maybe, so I think I was gonna talk just quickly. So some of the lessons, as I mentioned, around patterns of bed net use, um, there's a, people, people tend to use their bed nets more when there's more mosquitoes around, unsurprisingly, um, both um, when, the, when the rains come in Uganda, that's a typical, trigger for people to be using their bed nets. Um, and I think it's, there's a similar pattern in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, the age is also a significant factor, which has big public health implications about, as mentioned, the school-aged children, um, at least in the studies that I have done, they use their bed nets almost two hours less per night. So people are sleeping, you know, eight to nine hours um, to two fewer hours per night on average is, turns out to be a pretty significant um, amount of bed net use that uh, school-aged children seem to be missing. Um, and then finally, um, um, the, the differences in per hour use of bed nets. So one interesting finding is that children in, in, in the, our Uganda study were reporting going to sleep around 8 p.m. at night but the bed nets that they were using didn't seem to be going down until 9 p.m. And um, I couldn't figure that out until I talked to some people. And it just it relates to some, some behaviors in the household where the child will go to their bed at around 8 o'clock. And then later at night, around 9 o'clock, before the parents go to bed, they would come by and unfurl their bed nets. And so that, again, points to some potential um, interventions where we could explain to people that that hour where the child's sleeping um, without the bed net coverage, you know, they're sleeping under a net that's not yet unfurled is a potential hour of coverage that um, perhaps we could, you know, do some education and get people to put the bed nets down when the kids go to bed. And that would, again, um, decrease the total amount of mosquito exposure. And it points to the benefits of these, um, these tools that can measure hourly use uh, with high accuracy. Um, and then I think we're, maybe Benjamin, you wanna just talk quickly about kind of our next steps and what our hopes are for the future.
you there. So the, uh, what I say is that Paul and I have been presenting the study to many donors, and finally we have been successful to get some funds to conduct uh, a follow-up study in Cote d'Ivoire. We start very soon. And so some of the question is, why do some individual and household lose better frequently and over do not? Qualitative interview could elicit narrative of yours. Can we improve the accuracy of the accelerometer method? This could be done via experimental heart to train and test machine learning algorithm to improve classification accuracy. However, this is in discussion with USA and it's very advanced. And we got recently, as I said, additional field study in various settings. The USID plan, Paul is using it in Uganda, and we got the approval from Gate to do some study in Cote d'Ivoire, and we are in discussion with USAID as well. I don't know if you want to add something on that, Paul. No, I think um, we're, we're Benjamin and I are both very excited because this study uh, is Cote d'Ivoire is something that, that we're doing together now. And so we sort of joined forces at this point and we're able to present to, to Gates, we're able to present to, to PMI, President's Malaria Initiative, which is U, the USCID groups. Um, and and um, by, by working together, we've been able to get a lot of interest. And I think going forward, this, this way of monitoring bed nets is going to be uh, much more common and, and maybe the standard um, for, for surveillance of bed net use in, in many settings in the future. So I think it's, that's, we're really excited about that. We're coming to the end of our time here. Um, uh, Adrian, you just want to talk about kind of like what we thought is kind of the conclusions of the talk? Go ahead, Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Malara Ruman is significant cause of child mortality in Sub Saharan Africa, which is very well known, which progress essentially is telling even pre COVID. And sexuality bedded are one of the most widely distributed tools for health promotion worldwide. And most of the donors say that that's it, that will be the main focus so far because indoor results spring, we have a lot of logistic talent. Very much, much that we do not know about how variation in malaria transmission intensity intersect with socioeconomic circumstances, cultural diversity, and individual behavior. We hope that our work, which depends our understanding on, on Bennett Joe's behavior to design more effective intervention to protect better children from malaria in the mid country. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me to be part of it, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I would second that. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And happy to answer any questions in the chat or, or in person as well. Thank you so much, Paul and Benjamin. I uh, really appreciate those insights in this conversation. Um, as Tiffany's put in the chat, the floor is, is now open for questions. If folks have questions, feel free to um, hopefully come off mute and, um, and mention them out loud. Uh, you can also put them in the chat, though. And I'm happy to, to start with one, and we can see where the conversation uh, goes. Uh, I mean, what you're essentially working on is a way to verify right what what folks are doing and um and fundamentally that's a question of trust uh, right and i think you know in, in the in the us we have similar questions and research going on as, as you've mentioned you know around like pill counters to see if people are actually taking their pills or uh, in recent times with covid there have been studies involving observers of mask wearing to see, you know, people who are wearing masks, uh, say they're wearing masks, are wearing masks. Um, I'm just curious if you can expand a little bit on, uh, and maybe this question is for Benjamin, on um, the reception of that type of research. I think, I think you've mentioned that people are open to it, but can you describe a little bit more on 
what that looks like um, with this fundamental question of trust? Yeah, thank you very much. It is a really a good question. And because at the beginning, when I, I started the first study in 2014, people were very, very reluctant. They think that the sensor, the accelerometer you are fixing, attaching, or you are tagging on the net could be a type of camera. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, but when we try to explain to them and we even show them the data this accelerometer is collecting, they become confident now and they agree to be part of the study. So it is very important uh, at the beginning to not be suspicious, to tell them clearly what you are, what you are expecting from them, what type of data you expect to collect from them. And is, you, are, you, you, are, you, you are trying, by using this accelerometer, you are trying to limit the number of invasive action because before people used to come at night uh, without informing the household member and going directly to, to, to the bedroom to check if people are really sleeping under the bed. So it is, it is to, to avoid this type of uh, violation of the privacy that you are using this type of tool. So I think after that, people become much more confident and we were able to use the tool in many, many uh, households in Malara setting. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I would certainly prefer an accelerometer to someone coming in while I'm sleeping and checking. Um, thank you. Questions from others? All right. Um, I imagine if there are additional questions, would it be all right to uh, refer them directly to you via email, Paul and Benjamin? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you.